Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, the eighth of the Shell London Lectures for the year 2012. And this evening it's entitled Pollutants and Human Health in the Age of Man, sometimes called the Anthropocene, the Age of Man. Uh, my name's Philip Allen and I'm partly responsible for this year's programme. Uh, I was the head of the Science Committee, so I uh, invited Jane to give this talk. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening and also to thank Shell UK for making this series of public lectures possible. Now, just by way of a brief introduction, um, between 160 and 200,000 years ago, a biological change took place on the Earth that would really disrupt the natural equilibrium of the place. <clears throat> the Earth had slumbered in its existence for the, for the previous 4.5 billion years. That great thing that disturbed the equilibrium was the arrival of us. As human cultured cultures developed, soils began to be depleted in essential <clears throat> trace elements. Mining and mineral working caused local pollution, especially with arsenic and with mercury. <clears throat> Soon there was large-scale disruption of the Earth system, beginning in the 17th century in Europe with the agricultural and industrial revolutions. And by the second part of the 20th century, the natural equilibrium, equilibrium of the Earth had really been destroyed. Burgeoning populations, increased consumption of energy-intensive animal rather than vegetable-based protein, and a demand for material possessions and for travel were responsible for this. Now we have new chemicals, plastics, detergents, pharmaceuticals, nanomaterials, very small size materials. They're all being released into the environment. So politicians are battling to deal with just one of these chemical impacts, the accumulation of greenhouse gases. They're primarily concerned with one of the elements of the periodic table, carbon. But that's just the start. Fundamental changes in human behaviour are needed if human life on Earth is to be sustained beyond the present century. Speaking to us today about these issues is Professor Jane Plant, CBE, author of the best-selling selling book on overcoming breast cancer called Your Life in Your Hands, and several other groundbreaking books on health, including osteoporosis and prostate cancer, and most recently, Beating Stress, Anxiety and Depression. Jane formerly Chief Scientist of the British Geological Survey, is Professor of Geochemistry in, <coughs> in Imperial College London and holds a DSC, seven honorary degrees and many prizes and distinctions for her contributions to science. These include Fellowship of the Royal Academy of Engineering, Life Fellowship of the Royal Society of Medicine and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She was a member of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution and until 2008 chaired the government's advisory committee on hazardous substances. So Jane speaks with some authority. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jane Plant. Um, thank you all very much for coming, and I'd particularly like to thank the Geological Society for inviting me. I regard it as a great honour to be asked to give a Shell lecture. As you heard, I'm going to talk about pollutants in human health in the age of man, and the talk is basically in two parts. In the first part, I shall be discussing a lot of the damage that we have a as a species have inflicted on the planet, and then in the second part, I want to try to come up with some suggestions as to what we can do to help. Well, first of all, what do we need, mean by the age of man? 
Um, Homo sapiens, which interestingly means wise man, evolved only 200,000 years ago from a common ancestor uh, called African Eve. They've done this via mitochondrial DNA, which is female DNA, which is why they can't say anything about the male ancestor. Now, part of our success is because the human brain is the most complex object in the known universe. And I don't know any science who would, scientist who would disagree with that. And you can see how we've spread across the planet. And interestingly, initially, modern humans, which rapidly replaced Neanderthalers, were black. And the point is, whether we're black, yellow, red, white, we are the same species. So if we make a mess of our planet, we are all in this together. This is the um, slide showing an attempt at the geological record, but I haven't got enough space to go back to 4,500 million years. And I want you to note that the Holocene has been very favorable for human life, but we're having such an impact on it that several people have suggested that we're now in a new epoch called the Anthropocene. One person, Crutzen, has suggested that this began in the late 18th century based on CO2 emissions from the Industrial Revolution, but uh, Rudiman has suggested it began 8,000 years ago with settled agriculture. And the point I want to make from this slide is this is almost yesterday to a geologist. And if those of you who aren't geologists can visualize this, if you imagine a week is the Earth history, then we have appeared and made this mess and its impact in only the last fraction of a second. And these are some of the um, impacts we've had. Um, atmospheric pollution, soil pollution, to the extent that some people have suggested we are a disease that the Earth caught. Now, part of the problem is our consumerist economy. Um, I would think by now this figure of 1.7 billion people is much higher. Um, it's called the consumer class, the group of people characterized by diets of highly processed food, desire for bigger houses, more and bigger cars, high levels of debt, and lifestyles devoted to the accumulation of non-essential goods. So consumerism is a big driver of the damage we've done. But the one that people often don't mention is population. Um, we are already um, in this position here. And I think you can all see how hugely population is scheduled to grow. And when you think about the damage we have done, just lifting the North American and European population into this modern consumer world, what on earth is going to happen if we try to do with this? I think, and I don't know any geologist who would demur, that this is a not possible to do without inflicting incredible damage on the earth that may not be recoverable. Now, turning to chemicals, um, many people now appreciate the health impacts of chemicals. And here are some of the organizations involved. They're now li being linked increasingly to a range of illnesses. And a lot of chemicals are involved. And as I said, politicians have been preoccupied with just one. But there's a whole range of chemicals that are of concern. And a recent Nature article stressed that the nitrogen cycle was far more disturbed than the CO2 cycle with implications from ocean acidification. And this is mostly coming from chemical agriculture. Now, we also are learning how there are potentially sensitive subgroups. And there's a particular emphasis on fetuses and a group of chemicals I shall talk about later called endocrine disrupting chemicals, which mess up our hormone systems. Now, this sums up the problem. We're dealing with a highly variable group of chemicals with the potential to cause harm. They're also their metabolites and conjugates in the environment. They're in a wide range of environmental media, from surface and groundwater, soil and marine systems, at high, high nanogram to low milligram per litre concentrations. And the possible effects of many of these chemicals singly, let alone in combination, on the environment and human health is pretty well unknown. Well, 
chemicals nowadays tend to be managed on a risk-based um, principle. So um, we have a source of a hazardous substance, but provided the environment or individuals are not exposed, then there is no risk. So we have to have a pathway to cause a risk. And if there is a risk, we then have to deal with risk management, assessment, and all the, all the problems. But just to illustrate this point, um, I deal a lot with the mining in industry. They use some pretty hazardous chemicals, but because they are so experienced in the management of these chemicals, brilliant uh, metallurgists and mining engineers, there's almost no risk that we can calculate. On the other hand, if they treat their property with bringing a, some sort of um, a person who is contracted to look after their farm or something, then that, that's when they may be bringing in a risk. And this applies to many, many types of, of industrial operations. So the main groups of chemicals I'm going to talk about are inorganic elements, uh, such as selenium or iodine, which are needed in trace amounts. If you don't have them, uh, people can become ill, but they can be toxic at high levels. Harmful elements uh, with species with adverse effects at very low levels, such as arsenic and mercury. Radioactive substances, including natural isotopes and also from the nuclear industry. <coughs> Persistent organic pollutants and their metabolites, which have three very nasty properties. They're very persistent. They don't break down in the environment. They're usually very fat-soluble, and they bioaccumulate up the food chain, up the food web. And they're toxic in one way or another, often carcinogens or reprotoxic. Also want to deal briefly with uh, human and veterinary pharmaceuticals, because these have particular biological targets, and they have the potential to cause harm at incredibly low concentrations. And finally, particulates and nanoparticles. So um, first of all, the chemicals that we've been concerned about for longer, these are the ones depleted by agriculture or causing local pollution from the mineral industry. And this is a problem that I worked on with my colleagues in BGS a long time ago. Um, these two ladies are Chinese ladies. They are the same age. But when this lady was challenged with the Coxsackie B virus, she was deficient in selenium, and this left her with this very nasty um, bone disease, which obviously is going to affect her the rest of her life. And the area affected also had a lot of heart disease, also caused by selenium deficiency. Well, there was, a fairly, there was actually plenty of selenium there. It just wasn't getting through because of the way they were doing agriculture, and we were able to come up with a very low-tech way of dealing with this. Um, at the same time, as I said, these are trace elements which, if you have too much, cause toxicity. And one of the first problems with too much selenium is uh, this sort of patchy baldness. These are some of the principal health effects of this group of toxic trace elements. Lead first shown in uh, poor black neighborhoods in the States, uh, where children were being shown to be affected by tetraethyl lead confirmed by isotope analysis. Cadmium in Japan, uh, this was just ouch-ouch disease because their bones were spontaneously fracturing from uh, okay. cadmium. I'm going to be dealing with the arsenic and its cancer-causing properties. Mercury is very dangerous for our nervous system, and platinum, which I should also be talking about, directly causes mm -hmm. DNA damage. Well, this is the old Rio Tinto mine in Spain, which was worked for more than 5,000 years. And you can see it's causing a lot of local pollution. Although modern mining, it wouldn't happen. Um, but the problem is that much of the contamination now has gone global. And this is well illustrated by mercury. As I said, it's highly neurotoxic. Levels have increased to a point where international action is being taken to reduce levels. And I chaired a panel on behalf of DEFRA at Oxford University to try and reach some international agreement on this three years ago. Man-made mercury is now 95% of the total, and it's three times higher than in 1896, such that the US FDA is putting out warnings about eating too much tuna, especially to pregnant mothers and other vulnerable groups. Now, it's not 
from using thermometers, which some of our um, civil servants seem to think, it's actually from burning Gondwana coal, that's Chinese coal and Indian coal, and from poorly controlled metal workings. That will not be Western mining companies, it will be uh, the poorly controlled um, companies from countries such as China um, that are causing the problem, and a lot of artisanal mining. And just to show you the problem in, in, in Bangladesh of arsenic, which my team worked on, um, what happened was that um, the, head, the Indians were taking more and more of the water, the Bangladeshis were getting less and less, it was increasingly contaminated, and there was a lot of um, <coughs> contamination from fecal material with a lot of illness. So the World Bank came along and drilled these large tube wells into the um, sediment coming off the Himalayas, uh, but they didn't check the water for arsenic. And after about five or 15 years, um, people like this beautiful young woman started developing these horrible lesions on their legs, many of which would turn into skin cancer and bladder cancer became um, very rife. And we now know that this was because the, um, the iron oxide, which normally takes arsenic out, was in a state where the iron was soluble, so the arsenic was not being absorbed. And you can see here that about 20 to 30 million people are drinking this arsenical water now in Bangladesh. And it's not just Bangladesh. As we, as we have these large populations and are forced to develop groundwater resources, we're finding quite a few areas of the world, including the USA, are uh, pushing their groundwater to become arsenical. These are some maps of Europe, in this case showing arsenic in soil and cadmium in soil. They're both downloadable. It's from a project we did with Europe to make geochemical maps for soil, water, all sorts of chemicals, and these are downloadable off the website. This is a, a part of the BGS where I used to work, um, a large area of the Midlands, and you can see even here there's a large belt of, of arsenical rocks, naturally arsenical rocks, uh, going through, for example, through the Northamptonshire. This has changed slightly now, but you can see that quite a large area is above the soil guideline value for arsenic. Now, that'll be fine provided the iron is oxidized. But if people decide to put on a lot of organic manure or something, that arsenic may be mobilized. So, um, you know, it's very important that BGS is documenting where these sort of areas are. Now, there are a load of different chemical species. It's not just the level of arsenic. It's what, what form it's in. And the same goes for selenium. For example, if you have organic arsenic, like arsenobetane in fish, then um, it's totally non-toxic. It's just like beetroot juice. It goes straight through people without causing any damage. But that's far too complicated to work out. Well, I, I have to say the next few slides are very whizzy because the student who did them is a very talented Italian lady. So if they're more whizzy than the others, that's the explanation. Um, she did a, a, a project looking into the potential impacts of vehicle exhaust catal catalysts whereby a lot of us as environmentalists thought these would do a very good job in taking out some of the nasty gases. Um, again, this is, what we did was we looked at the um, bioavailability. So what, instead of working out some complicated chemistry, this is work we did at BGS. We built an extraction line which mimicked the human digestive tract. So you first of all put your substance you want to see is it bioavailable into a, a chemical stomach and then into a chemical intestine and etc. And this is a very good uh, way of assessing bioavailability. At Imperial we also did this uh, with lung fluids to see if you inhale particles of platinum in road dust is it bioavailable. I can't get this to stop breathing. <laughs> Thank you. And can you... Here we go. And, and what did this show? Well, the original experiments to approve 
the use of um, autocatalysts were done by looking at the uh, bioavailability of autocatalysts and hydroxide, platinum hydroxide materials. And you can see it looks as if they're very poorly bioavailable. However, when all those gases, those exhaust gases have gone for, through the converter, you can see that the bioavailability becomes considerably higher in the digestive tract. If you use a gamble solution, which is the normal um, neutral pH solution, that's how lungs are bathed in, again, no bioavailability. But if our lungs decide to try to uh, engulf phagocytosis on the platinum particles, I think you can see that the fluid that's released then, which is a very acid fluid, actually means that the particle becomes much more bioavailable. I want to turn now to um, radioactive elements and, uh, of course, the main concern, our main knowledge, I can remember as a child in the 50s looking at these horrible images on the television of these great big mushroom clouds going off and I think that is the memory many of us have about radioactivity and why some of us still find it very um, frightening. Now, it's the damage that's done by this, it's not complicated like toxic trace elements. It's straightforward DNA damage, which means that radioactivity is mutagenic or carcinogenic, causes cancer, or it mutates our genes, which can have implications for future generations. But I think this is a very um, <coughs> revealing slide when it comes to human risk. This shows the official uh, average uh, irradiation of a UK citizen, about 2.6 millisieverts a year. The average US citizen, 6.4 millisieverts a year. Now, the impact from the new in both cases, and in the UK, much of our radiation comes from uh, things like natural radon gas, which I'll go into in a moment. In the US, look at this huge amount, almost 50%, which is more than the entire dose that the UK citizens get, is from medical treatment and diagnostics. So our press, our media, is always telling us about the problems of the nuclear industry, when in fact the main risk is from um, medical treatment and diagnostics in the USA because one CT scan gives a dose of about 500 to 1,000 times higher than a chest x-ray. I just want to look at the UK again. Um, this is a map of radon potential that was made when I was at the BGS and I think anyone would have predicted that the granites of southwest England would have high radon potential. They admit this invisible radioactive gas that is linked to lung cancer. And what nobody predicted was that the limestones of the Derbyshire Peak District would also have high radon potential because at the time all the textbooks said that um, limestones were not a problem in this respect. And it shows the need to get real data, not just models. And this is some work that Lord Oxborough did when he's kindly let me have his slides, showing that if you move from a low radon risk area to a high radon risk area, your um, radiation increase, the dose you get, is more than if you were, than that allowed if you were sitting immediately over a nuclear waste repository. And this is some of um, my own group's work where we compared the sort of characteristics of one of these giant uranium ore deposits in the Athabasca Basin in Canada with a planned uh, nuclear waste repository. You can see that the deposit is a, an order of magnitude greater and you can see that it's in <coughs> fractured sandstone aquifers 1.5 um, <coughs> years old uh, supplying major cities. Now, that would never be allowed for a nuclear waste repository. It would be considered far too risky. But in my early days, I did exploration for these type of deposits, and it was very interesting because you couldn't detect them using radioactivity methods, geochemical methods, or isotopically. Yet they were sitting there, these huge deposits, in these major aquifers. I want to turn now to persistent organic pollutants. Um, and this slide 
one of the things about it is that it shows pesticides. And the thing that always strikes me, we're always told how safe they are, so why do you have to dress up as if you're going to the moon to spray these things? And these are increasingly being implicated, this whole group of persistent organic pollutants in a whole range of, um, of, of illnesses and conditions. And as um, someone said, I used to work on the Royal Commission and we did look at chemicals. And what we found was that although many of them had been put through standard toxicological and other tests, there were often surprises. So, for example, DDT, which was thought to be a really safe chemical when it was made, turned out to be an endocrine disruptor and also toxic. Many of them bioaccumulated, CFCs were ozone depleters, and uh, so on and so forth. So a lot of them were regarded as good chemicals, but turned out to have problems. And the Royal Commission, which normally um, is very careful in its phraseology, stated in its chemical report that ignorance outweighs knowledge at every stage. And one of the problems with these chemicals is that um, often, even if you use them at low latitudes, they show this grasshopper effect like the CFCs and accumulate at very high latitudes. And I think this was first realized when a study was done on the Inuits who were thought, people thought they were going to pristine condition to find where people would have very low levels of these chemicals. And in fact, they found they were much, much higher than anywhere else they had seen them. I want to look now in about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Because in the 1960s, Rachel Carson published her wonderful book, Silent Spring, which led to the setting up of the American Environmental Protection Agency, of which she was the first director. And she pointed out that chemicals such as DDT and other organochlorines were causing um, top predator birds, such as hawks, to have eggshells which were very, very thinned. And she attributed this directly to the chemicals and their effect on the birds' hormone systems. By the 70s, we had a problem in the UK whereby our dog whelks and our oysters, the females were being turned into creatures like this because of a chemical called organotin, which blocks, which is an aromatase inhibitor. So these creatures were being masculinized. So all the females in these populations were being turned into males, a feature called impersex. The next thing that we heard about was hermaphrodism in frogs as a result of atrazine, a commonly used herbicide on corn in America. And then in the UK in the 80s, we began to learn that a lot of our fish were feminized, especially around sewage treatment works. So instead of the normal section through a testes full of sperm, there were these large female eggs in the feminized fish. But it wasn't until 1993 that somebody pieced all this together. Another distinguished American woman scientist, this time Thea Colborn, who suggested that all these things represented endocrine disruption that the animal's hormone system had been disrupted. And I talked to her on the phone and said, how on earth did you piece all this together? Well, apparently, she, worked in, she works in the University of Florida. She's now emeritus, I believe. And she had been asked to look into why there were so many deformities in various species of wildlife and why there were changes in behavior, like lots of same-sex nesting and mating. And she said she looked at magnetic radiation, ionizing radiation, all sorts of uh, infections. But the common denominator was the body of the creatures affected were full of chemicals such as plasticizers, detergents, pharmaceuticals, etc., etc. And she realized that the structure of these chemicals was such that they would interfere with the hormone systems of, of animals and humans. Now, does this matter to people? Well, there is a great increase in hormone-dependent cancers in the UK. And this is um, one um, where um, certain uh, chemicals, including phthalates, have been suggested to play a role in uh, testicular dysgenesis syndrome, whereby initially there is an impaired sperm quality. Then you can get cryptorchism, where there are undescended testicles. 
hyperspadius, where the urethra, instead of opening at the end of the penis, opens in a female position behind it, and finally, testicular cancer. And quite a lot of people are linking the initiation of some of these conditions to um, endocrine disrupting chemical exposure, and increasingly it's thought to be in utero. Turning now to pharmaceuticals, um, worldwide thousands of tons are used annually, but often we don't know much about their environmental fate. And we think up to 90% may be excreted <coughs> with their metabolites converted back to the active compounds by bacteria. Conventional sewage treatment works, which were designed in Victorian times, were designed to remove organic molecules, large ones, nutrients such as nitrates and phosphorus, and, uh, and heavy metals. But they may not be effective in removing pharmaceuticals, which are often quite tiny molecules. Measured concentrations are in the nanogram to microgram range, but their biological effects and continuous release into waters from sewage treatment plants means that aquatic life is chronically exposed to a mixture of these biologically highly potent chemicals. Most of that feminization of fish is, is thought to be from the female contraceptive pill and hormone replacement uh, pill, for example. What's been done about it? Well, there was an initial, these are just some of the things that have been uh, done. Initial ri risk assessment for the UK on various painkillers and antidepressants and various other drugs, uh, monitoring in Europe, America for some of these drugs. But I think we were all quite shocked in 2006 when nationwide reconnaissance in the US from extraction um, wells that were used to provide water to settlements, in some samples there are as many as 38 substances. Some of them would be drugs for schizophrenia, heart disease, chemotherapeutic agents, and this cocktail was of, of great concern. And, and again, there have been other findings, and recently um, a whole range of pharmacologically active substances, including beta blockers and uh, anti-epileptic drugs and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, have been reported to occur in both animal and human milk. Turning briefly to nanotechnology, uh, this is the study of matter at atomic and molecular scales, really tiny scales, and their properties differ from those at larger scales. To just use gold as an example, um, in its macro state, gold is a, a very good conductor of electricity and heat, and it is golden. When it is in nanoparticles, it is red, and it is an insulator rather than a conductor. So, complete change of properties. This is a slide from George Smith, who is arguably one of the um, world experts on nanotechnology. And the technology is the application of this knowledge to making new material structures and devices, and here are the famous buckyballs. But hence there is a risk, because new and different things happen at the nanoscale, and we're not really sure how to evaluate the hazards or the risks. And should this be of concern? Well. I am a geologist. I've worked with asbestos a lot. It looks beautiful. And when you look at its chemistry, it's a silicate. You would think it would have no activity at all. But of course, it causes this horrible disease, mesothelioma. So here we have some normal lungs with the normal pleura around the edge of the lungs, quite thin and fine. Here we have lungs from somebody with mesothelioma, where you've got cancer in the pleura and the lungs are progressively um, compressed. Now, this affects a lot of people in the UK, and the epidemic has still not reached its maximum. And the people who are affected are people like plumbers and woodworkers and people who unwittingly drilled into things which have um, asbestos, especially the blue asbestos, chrysidolite, in them. So here are some of the causes of concern, again, from Professor George Smith. Um, some TI2 particles can show photocatalytic activity, so chemical changes can be triggered by sunlight. We know that insertion of carbon nanotube into mouse lungs triggers aggressive immunological response. I've mentioned asbestos. 
And there's a long incubation times in these diseases, so that screening is very difficult. We also know that inhalation of soluble particles can cause disease. In my own uh, mining area, it's long been known that manganese Parkinsonism can occur, where manganese is absorbed from tiny particles, dissolved in the body, and redeposited re uh, in the brain. And we're using more and more chemical elements, um, especially in, in nanoscale powders. We're also using chemicals such as rhenium, which used to be just a waste product from copper and molybdenum mining, for example, so that um, jet engines can reach higher temperatures, go faster and use lower fuel. And things like indium we're using, um, for example, to make um, windscreens for um, jet engines and fast railways. And a lot of these chemicals, we've not got much experience. We don't know much about their environmental fate. And all the time, we keep concocting yet more insecticides, herbicides, and other novel organic compounds used in a whole range of industries. <coughs> so this is the question that Sir Martin Rees asked. Is this the final century for Homo sapiens on planet Earth? And this slide shows the Earth, which is this lovely blue watery planet turning into something like Mars. And I think we've all heard recently that Mars had rivers and water on it. Uh, some of my colleagues at Imperial think they found the remains of an ocean on Mars. So um, I've put this rather scary slide on just to try and make us think. Now, we do have some improved legislation. I'm not going to this in any great detail except to say that since June 2007, we've had REACH, which um, essentially restricts the manufacture or import of these very hazardous materials. The main problem with REACH is, as I said, it restricts, it, it restricts manufacture, restricts import of these hazardous chemicals, but it does not address the issue of toxic chemicals in consumer products. So if somebody makes some children's toy in China, they can use the toxic chemicals. And this just shows the outgassing of a children's toy and some quite nasty chemicals coming off that toy, and quite a few of them will be toxic. So in the past, what we have done is what is seen as unsustainable development. We've taken energy and raw materials. We've made the product we wanted for industrial agriculture. And then often the product and all the things used to make it have just gone 100% to uh, lead to waste and pollution. We've been doing quite a lot better than that in a lot of industries because we've been looking at the whole life cycle of the um, of the substance and the land used to uh, make a product or extract a product to try to improve performance at all stages. And this just shows some work Imperial College did. Um, in the old days, if you went to a mining site, it would often look like the moon. I remember seeing the Sudbury nickel mine and thinking it looked like I imagined the moon to look. And that was often because sulfur dioxide was being discharged very acid and burning all the vegetation around. What this plant shows, work that John Monhemius led on, is that instead of just emitting the sulfur dioxide, you take it off as sulfuric acid. One, you limit the damage to the environment enormously, but two, you have another saleable product, sulfuric acid. And as I said, also we need to consider land. So, for example, in mineral exploration, you need to consider it all the way through to reuse. <coughs> and the example I often use is the National Forest because they extracted a lot of coal, including recently, but now they've restored the land and it's become a rather attractive national forest. And I think we have to uh, regard land in this way. But I think we have to take it further, and this is... Um, a concept from the distinguished um, environmentalist Michael Braungart, who said, well, the biomass of ants on Earth is greater than that of humans, but that's because they continually recycle everything. And he suggested that we also need to recycle 
our technical nutrients, and I'll come on to this in a moment, but one of the big problems we have is that our sewage sludge is contaminated with these. The Chinese for ages kept these separate, but now theirs is mixed too. So I want to touch on a little later about what we might be able to do about that. And one of the big problems is that over the last 50 years, especially in America, things have been made so they'll wear out. So we have to keep buying new, new, new things. And if we're going to do this, this shows a mobile phone and all the things in it, including some very valuable um, substances. But the problem is, to get these out again, it's almost impossible. And you can see pictures of poor women in China trying to heat these things up and extract the things. And Baumgart argues, and I think he's absolutely right, we ha if we're going to go for this recycling of fashionable things, we have to design and build things that are recyclable. So right from the outset, recyclability must be designed in to products. And this is a rather um, interesting slide. It shows an image of how people think the Sahara Desert would have looked only 5,000 years ago. 5,000 years ago. It was the greenest place on the planet and had the biggest freshwater lake on the planet, now shrunken down to the polluted, <coughs> rather nasty little Lake Chad. <coughs> this is uh, what it looks like now. And I think, just as on Mars, you can see that this was once a river. And that's the BGS Land Rover in the old river bed. So clearly something dramatic happened. Some people say it was just climate change, but increasingly people are suggesting it was an interaction of human activity with climate change, as in the Dust Bowl in America. And this is one of the great problems of desertification. Most of our deserts are on the move. And I recently had lunch with somebody who was a government advisor at a meeting in Cambridge, and we were discussing population and impacts. And he said, oh, well, every economist will tell you Africa could take a population three times the size. And when I pointed out, but don't you know the Sahara is moving south at 30 miles every year? He didn't know that. He didn't know that humanity was disrupting the territories of lions and elephants and affecting their behavior. He didn't know that this landscape had Deeply, had been deeply uh, leached and lost its selenium and iodine. And it's very worrying that people with so little knowledge of science or the environment are advising the government almost always. And of course, what had he read at Cambridge? Classics. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I wanted to make a plea that as geologists, we get involved in this debate. I know people often change the subject when you mention population, but I think if we as geologists don't say that the population growth is unsustainable and looks increasingly unsustainable, I really think we need to make that point. This idea that economists have that, oh, we'll get to 2050 and it will flatten off, I, I don't think that's acceptable because when you have that number of people, if we lift them out of poverty, it's going to have such an incredible impact. Habitat destruction, um, a recent Nature article made the point that biodiversity was more damaged than the climate. Um, I think the economic growth model, endless economic growth, as we are doing it now with all this throwaway society, is completely unsustainable. And some of the impacts we're having, Groundwater sources depleted. Many of these date from 20,000 years ago. They were the basis for the Green Revolution, and we are mining them. We're not using them sustainably. Many are polluted, and many are sucking in salt water and becoming saline, which will be unrecoverable. I'm not going to mention climate change. We hear about it so much. Ocean acidification, and particularly things like uh, nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Soils degraded, contaminated, and increasingly with desertification. So I just want to go through just a few um, potential solutions that we as geologists might offer. If we're going to control population in any humane way, it has to be through the empowerment and education of women. That is shown by so many studies, so many data, 
and I think some of our religious groups need to come into the, this century and start appointing women archbishops. <laughs> I think we need to comment about energy. I really think that this obsession with onshore windmills is, is so stupid. When I was at BGS, we did a model of the land take to replace one thermal coal burning power station, Drax, and it took the whole of Scotland and part of Northern England to generate as much energy. And that wasn't doing things like saying, well, when it when the wind isn't blowing, we get no energy, and when the wind is blowing too much, we have to switch them all off or they'd burn the natural grid out. And if you did a life cycle analysis, I bet they're introducing quite a lot of radioactivity because of the use of rare earths. As I said, I think all consumables need to be made fully recyclable. I'd like to see agriculture increasingly based on recycling of nutrients, not the use of man-made nitrates, which we just let go into the environment, causing acidification. And sewage sludge, often it's now burnt at 850 degrees centigrade because supermarkets, certainly the more upmarket ones, will not buy food grown in it. And people in some part, in the UK, are taking off the biogas. In other countries, people are looking at taking off the nutrients like the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. In Australia, they're looking how to take out the heavy metals, and in Germany and Japan, they're looking at how to take out the precious metals. What I would like to see is somebody develop an extraction line which progressively takes these things out so the sludge can be returned to land. I think that's just some of the suggestions, uh, just a, a sort of selection of them. I've stated over a lot of topics here at a very superficial level because what I've been trying to do is to get people to see the extent and complexity of the problems that we're causing. And um, at Imperial College, three of us have edited a book called Pollutants, Human Health and the Environment, a risk-based approach which goes into all these things in much more detail. And if anybody wants to buy it, your cheapest option is not your bookshop, not your university bookshop. I'm afraid it's Amazon. Thank you all very much. Thank you, James, for that very wide-ranging talk. It's a bit scary, isn't it? Um, a bit of a somber. Um, I'll open it up to the audience. Did read classics of Cambridge. You can put your hand up and someone says you may. To advise the government. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, two things I'd like to comment on. One, if man is supposed to be so intelligent, and by man I mean human species, uh, why don't we just forget about it and just become extinct? Because the Earth itself would then recover naturally and species have become extinct throughout geologic time and the Earth has recovered from one disaster or another. So we're just creating a disaster which is going to make us extinct. At the moment we're making about a thousand species extinct per year. That's our responsibility. But that will invariably affect us because we get medicines from trees and plants in the Amazon Delta which is slowly being converted into another Sahara Desert. Yes. Now scientists know this and we talk to politicians and we talk to the people who run countries, run companies and so on and they take no notice. They say oh yes but this is going to happen by 2015 and by then things will change or by 2050 or whatever time limit they put on these processes. Shouldn't it be more to the point to get more scientists Absolutely. into political situations and get more politicians and more industrial people to actually listen to us? I, I think one of the problems 
I used to be exasperated when I was chief scientist at the British Geological Survey because I was inevitably trying to talk to somebody. I'm sorry, but they'd all done classics at Oxford. And um, I mean, often, you know, I, I remember talking to somebody who was in the then Department of Energy. He didn't know what a kilojoule was. I remember talking to somebody at the time they closed all our coal mines down, explained to him that he was taxing a coal, I drew a, coal, a, a methane molecule and said, this comes out of a landfill site, you're saying it's renewable. If it comes out of a coal mine, you're saying it's non-renewable. And Germany did the, did the um, taxing the way I suggested. And this man suddenly said to me, how do you know all of this about mining? So I explained. And I said to him, well, you're in charge of everything. What's your background? Great, of course. <laughs> I mean, this, this is the problem. And I, I, you know, their counterparts in countries like France, Germany, or Japan, <coughs> I, you'd never meet a Sir Humphrey in those countries. And the permanent secretaries, really, if we, it's not the House of Lords that needs modernizing. Our first priority should be our Mandarin class civil servants, because they're the ones responsible for strategy. It's not the politicians, they're worried about the next election. Thank you. I think I should announce first that I didn't do classics. Excellent. Um, from your vantage point, or several vantage points, on advisory bodies of one sort or another, um, and perhaps leaving aside the point about civil servants, because they do have advice from various quarters, what is your view in the short, medium and long term of any hope of achieving any of the several very constructive solutions you've offered in one of the, one of the last slides? I think that um, things only change when you get through to people what the problem is and what some possible solutions are. I mean, um, with my book, Your Life in Your Hands, it, was, it showed all the problems of consuming dairy produce for um, hormone-dependent cancers. And unlike most other countries, I'm not saying it's just my book, lots of other people have said the same thing, but dairy in this country is really in decline. And I think the thing to do is for all of us to try to um, argue, write, point these things out so that ordinary people get the message. And then you can get change. I don't think you get it from the top down. I think it's once ordinary people get the message. So that could take a very, very, very long time. Well, it's a matter... I mean, Palab Ghosh always makes the point that scientists writing jargon so about six other people are going to understand it. And he said that anything that was published... I, I hope I'm not misquoting him, but it's along this lines, that anything that was funded by public money, there should be at least an abstract that was intellig intelligible to the average member of the, of the lay public, the average intelligent member of the lay public. And I mean, when I wrote the book, Your, Your Life in Your Hands, when I first took it to the publisher, his first reaction was, which six people are going to understand this, you know? So I had to learn to write in a totally different style. Well, thank you. My father did the classics at Cambridge, and he did, he did not have a clue about science, so I agree with you. My particular question is quite a, um, a particular one. Um, what about nano-silver particles being used in um, for clothing? And their effect on the environment? I can't answer that because I don't think there's enough... Um, well, I'm unaware of all the studies that have been done on it. I'm aware it's being used. Silver has long had antimicrobial properties, um, but I, I can't answer it because I don't think there's enough work going on into the hazards and risks of nanoparticles and nanotechnology. Um, and I, I, I must say, I think some Classicists are highly intelligent. Boris Johnson is my favourite classicist. <laughs> is a lady. Sorry. Can I? I was just going to... Yeah, go ahead. Um, on your point about the uh, windmills, um, I read some little while ago that in Germany they did some research and they decided that much as they've got lots of them, that they actually work against the environment because they unbalance the 
electricity output from the atomic and other things and make them worse. They have to keep turn they've had to turn them off quite a lot of times in Germany because otherwise they'd have had meltdown of their national grid. And I don't think a lot of people realised that when they were first uh, arguing. Yeah, well, what they do, they, where the atomic and the coal were working efficiently, mm. it makes them work inefficiently. Yes, yes. I think there are lots of problems with windmills, but uh, they've mostly sort of been brushed under the carpet. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was just thinking about what we can do at an individual level and um, I suppose my question is are you an advocate of organic farming for the yes. benefit for the individual and, yes. and also for the land? So do you think that if it was feasible for us to switch completely to organic farming then that would have a dramatic improvement? Um, in terms of general health and diseases. I'm not a, I'm not um, an agriculturalist but I mean um, because of my interest in health I read a lot of papers from and uh, work from people in the early part of the 20th century who were sent out to look at why are the Hunzas so help healthy that was Sir Robert McCarrison why are the Sikhs so healthy why are the Chinese so healthy not only physically but mentally they all reported back that it was their cycle of agriculture and also a lot of these communities were pretty well approaching veganism and yes I do eat organic food and yes I am a vegan and I'm not ashamed to say that I'm not some sandal I don't know what the image of the vegan is but um, uh, I don't think I fit the bill I, I think it is important we cut down on animal protein unfortunately we're going the wrong way and I used to go to chi work in China the school children were given a small bottle of um, soy milk at their morning break. Now it's all dairy, and um, to produce a bottle of, of cow's milk as opposed to soy milk, it's ten times the water, ten times the land, and you produce ten times the waste. You only have to think of what this would do as the Chinese switch to dairy to places like the Amazon, which they're buying up to grow soya, not to have themselves, but to put through cows to have dairy. Madness. Thank you. Um, you hear quite a lot about um, parabens and certain plastics being used. Um, what's your take on them and are they, because uh, sort of, they seem to be chemicals that are in the general psyche of, you know, that the layman does sort of, is aware of. Uh, what's your take on them? Well, I think they're both, I think I'm right in saying they're both, um, a lot of plasticizers are regarded as endocrine disrupting chemicals and I think parabens is estrogenic. I think I'm right. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, talk, Jane. You've reinforced all my worries. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of people actually realise that we're uh, in trouble, and uh, communities have started to act together. Uh, they're called transition towns. It started yes, in Tottenham, yes. and there's many of them mm. going. Do you think that they uh, are going along the right lines, and do you think there's any hope for those people who, who do it? I think the solution has to be global. As I said, we are all in this together. We're one species. We, and I, I really think there is hope, but I think it's through education. I think it needs, which is why I was saying, geologists come into the real world and start talking about these issues. You know, we tend to worry a lot about, you know, whether this bit of magma coming out of a volcano was sediment or something else 500 million years ago. Well, that's fine, but we also need to be making these points about the present Earth and its sustainability. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you for a very alarming lecture. Yeah. I think that just, to, I wanted to make two points. The first is that a lot of the problem is how to convey the information in the right language. Mm. I've just been in Singapore looking at uh, the affairs of Nanyang University in which a lot of very good work is going on, but the problem is how to communicate it. Yes. And what happens in Singapore is also what happens in this country. How can you communicate it? And that is a major problem, not just for scientists, but for those who want to understand what is going on. My second point is that when you want to bring about change, 
there are three, usually three main impulses. The first is when you get some leadership, and that is very important. Yes. And whatever people may say about Margaret Thatcher, she did give the leadership Indeed. on climate change. The second thing is when you get pressure coming from the kind of people who are in this room at the moment, asking the right questions, especially at election time, putting the heat on where they can put the heat on. And the last element, which I think is very important, which I hardly dare to mention, is what I call benign catastrophes, which is when something goes visibly yeah. and attributably wrong. <coughs> and so some of the things that you, for example, have spoken of, if you can show clearly that it was this rather than that that caused it, and that it's having the effects that you can then enumerate, then I think you have a very convincing case. But above all, it's a question of language. Yes, I agree. Mm, I think we have to learn to make our information far more accessible to people who aren't specialists. I agree completely. Uh, <coughs> My hair hasn't gone back to place yet. It's been standing on end ever since you started. Oh dear, I thought I came up with some But suggestions. it's been very rewarding. I'm probably going to be held down by everybody in a minute. When you flashed up the components that go to make a mobile phone, how are you going to stop this ever-increasing use of everything electronic? Not just a new type of mobile phone every year, but the books, Everywhere I look, I see people who are not looking at other people, they're looking at an e-book or a mobile phone or a gizmo of some sort. But because it's big money to governments, I can't see how we're ever going to stop it. I saw a long time ago in the Times a photograph of a six-year-old child in the middle of Africa scrabbling in the mud to get the minerals. Standing over him was another six-year-old child with a machine gun. Standing over him was an adult with a bigger gun. Is this what we're really aiming for in life? No. no. I, I, I mean, yes, it, it's a great concern, but as I said, I think we really do need to work on saying, you know, if you're going to manufacture a mobile phone, it has to be fully recyclable. You exactly. can't just throw all those components exactly. away. Exactly. And it, I marvel, did all these people who are walking around looking at these things spend that amount of time in the telephone box? <laughs> I can't answer that. I think we'll, we'll uh, wind it up. I'm sorry, um, but we're past our deadline. Um, in fact, I had one quick question that I wanted to That is, and this is a serious point, with, the, with carbon driven climate change, we know that we've committed to a lot of future climate change and sea level rise, even if we stop emitting today. What about with your kind of contamination, Jane? If we stop now and clean up our act, how long is it before we're clean? Well, nature often cleans. A lot of the chemicals up I've been talking about, for example, um, you know, lead quite quickly gets turned into insoluble forms, but it's just we're unrelentingly emitting it. Um, and a lot of organic chemicals get broken down by bacteria. Whenever we have a huge oil spill, people used to put on more toxic chemicals. They've now learned that the bugs can destroy the oil and recycle it far better if you don't put other toxic chemicals on. So I think a lot of this mess could be... Um, dealt with by nature. I think somebody made the point if we weren't here, it would all improve in Chernobyl. I mean, it's amazing. It's like the Garden of Eden because humanity's been kept out of it. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's been a tremendous set of questions. And I'd like to thank Professor Jane Plant once again on the board.